Summary of Thinking, Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Let enjoy the video, please subscribing to my channel for more great content like this. You'll be notified when I upload new videos. Thinking, Fast and Slow is a groundbreaking book by Nobel Prize winning psychologist Daniel Kahneman that explores the dual systems of thinking that drive our decision making processes. The book synthesizes decades of Kahneman's research, along with that of his collaborator Amos Tversky and other psychologists to provide a comprehensive look at how our minds work. Kahneman introduces two systems of thinking. 1. System 1, fast, intuitive, and emotional. 2. System 2, slower, more deliberative, and more logical. The book is divided into five parts, each exploring different aspects of these systems and their implications. Part 1, Two Systems. Kahneman introduces the concept of the two systems and explains how they interact. System 1 operates automatically and quickly, with little or no effort and no sense of voluntary control. System 2 allocates attention to the effortful mental activities that demand it, including complex computations. Part 2, Heuristics and Biases This section explores various cognitive biases and heuristics, mental shortcuts, that influence our thinking. These include anchoring effects, availability heuristic, substitution, and others. Kahneman explains how these biases can lead to errors in judgment and decision-making. Part 3. Overconfidence Kahneman discusses the tendency for people to be overconfident in their judgments and the illusion of understanding complex systems. He explores concepts like the planning fallacy, the illusion of validity, and intuitions versus formulas. Part 4. Choices This part focuses on prospect theory, which Kahneman developed with Tversky. It explains how people make decisions under uncertainty and why they often make choices that deviate from traditional economic theory. Part 5. Two Selves The final section introduces the concept of the experiencing self and the remembering self, exploring how our memories of experiences differ from the actual experiences themselves. Throughout the book, Kahneman uses numerous examples and thought experiments to illustrate his points, making complex psychological concepts accessible to a general audience. Key Concepts 1. System 1 and System 2, the two modes of thinking that shape our judgments and decisions. 2. Cognitive biases, systematic errors in thinking that affect our judgments and decisions. 3. Heuristics, mental shortcuts that can lead to good or bad decisions depending on the context. 4. Prospect theory, a model of decision-making under risk that challenges traditional economic theory. 5. Framing effects how the presentation of information can significantly influence our choices. 6. Anchoring, the tendency to rely too heavily on the first piece of information offered when making decisions. 7. Availability heuristic, judging the probability of an event based on how easily examples come to mind. 8. Overconfidence, the tendency to overestimate our own abilities and the accuracy of our predictions. 9. Loss aversion, the tendency to prefer avoiding losses to acquiring equivalent gains. 10. Sunk cost fallacy, the tendency to continue an endeavor once an investment in money, effort, or time has been made. 11. Regression to the mean, the phenomenon where extreme events are likely to be followed by more moderate ones. 12. Substitution, answering an easier question in place of a difficult one. 13. Priming, how exposure to one stimulus influences the response to another stimulus. 14. Experiencing self versus remembering self, the distinction between how we experience events and how we remember them. 15. Planning fallacy, the tendency to underestimate the time, costs, and risks of future actions while overestimating the benefits. 16. Narrative fallacy, the tendency to create explanatory stories to link events, even when the events may be random or unrelated. 17. Focusing illusion, the tendency to place too much importance on one aspect of an event, leading to inaccurate predictions about the overall outcome. These concepts have had a profound impact on various fields, including economics, psychology, and decision science. Kahneman's work has challenged traditional assumptions about human rationality and has important implications for how we understand decision-making in areas ranging from personal finance to public policy. Before looking detail summary, please subscribing to my channel for more great content like this. Summary Deep Drive Part 1, 
Two systems. Imagine you're walking through a bustling city street. As you navigate the crowd, dodge obstacles, and take in the sights and sounds around you, your brain is continuously processing information and making decisions. This is where Kahneman's concept of two systems comes into play. System 1, the fast thinker, is like your constant companion on this city walk. It's always on, always active, requiring little to no conscious effort. As you stroll, System 1 is what allows you to recognize faces in the crowd, read store signs effortlessly, and instinctively step around a puddle without breaking your stride. It's quick, intuitive, and operates on autopilot. Suddenly, someone approaches you with a math problem. What's 17 times 24? This is where System 2, the slow thinker, takes center stage. You pause your walk, furrow your brow, and begin the mental calculations. This system is deliberate, logical, and requires concentrated effort. It's the part of your mind that engages when you need to solve complex problems, make difficult decisions, or focus intently on a task. Kahneman explains that while System 2 believes itself to be in charge, it's actually System 1 that's running the show most of the time. System 1 is constantly generating impressions, intuitions, and feelings that System 2 often endorses with little or no modification. It's only when System 1 encounters something it can't handle, like that multiplication problem, that it calls on System 2 for backup. But here's the twist, System 1, for all its speed and efficiency, is prone to biases and errors. It relies on mental shortcuts, heuristics, that, while often useful, can sometimes lead us astray. For instance, as you continue your walk, you might see a person in a suit and automatically assume they're successful or wealthy, a quick judgment made by System 1 based on limited information. System 2, on the other hand, is capable of more nuanced, rational thinking. It can question the assumptions made by System 1 and engage in more thorough analysis. However, it's also lazy and tends to conserve energy whenever possible. This means we often default to System 1's quick judgments even when a situation might benefit from slower, more deliberate thought. Kahneman illustrates this interplay with numerous examples throughout the book. One classic example is the bat and ball problem. A bat and ball cost $1.10 in total. The bat costs $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Many people's System 1 quickly jumps to the conclusion that the ball costs 10 cents. It feels right, it's a fast and easy answer. But if you engage System 2 and think it through carefully, you'll realize that if the ball cost 10 cents and the bat cost $1 more, the total would be $1.20, not $1.10. The correct answer is that the ball costs 5 cents and the bat costs $1.05. This example demonstrates how System 1's quick, intuitive responses can sometimes lead us astray and why it's important to engage System 2 for more complex or consequential decisions. Understanding these two systems and how they interact is crucial, Kahneman argues, because it helps us recognize when we might be falling prey to cognitive biases or making decisions based on faulty intuitions. By being aware of when we're relying on System 1 versus System 2, we can make more informed choices about when to trust our gut and when to engage in more deliberate, analytical thinking. This concept of two systems forms the foundation for the rest of Kahneman's book, providing a framework for understanding the various cognitive biases, heuristics, and decision-making processes that he explores in subsequent chapters. Part 2, Heuristics and Biases Let's delve into the world of heuristics and biases, as explored in Part 2 of Kahneman's thinking, Fast and Slow. Imagine you're a detective, tasked with solving the mysteries of the human mind. As you investigate, you discover that our brains, brilliant as they are, often rely on mental shortcuts to navigate the complexities of daily life. These shortcuts, or heuristics, are like well-worn paths through a dense forest of information. They're incredibly useful, allowing us to make quick decisions without getting bogged down in endless analysis. But sometimes, these shortcuts can lead us astray, resulting in systematic errors in judgment that Kahneman calls cognitive biases. One day, you're walking down the street and see a headline, Shark Attack at Local Beach. Suddenly, you're reconsidering your weekend plans to go swimming. This is the availability heuristic at work. Your brain quickly recalls dramatic, memorable events, like shark attacks, and uses them to judge the likelihood of similar events occurring. But in reality, shark attacks are extremely rare. 
your system one thinking has led you to overestimate the risk based on how easily you can recall examples. Next, you're at a car dealership, considering a new purchase. The salesperson shows you a luxury model priced at $50,000. You balk at the price, so they quickly show you a mid-range model for $30,000. Suddenly, $30,000 doesn't seem so bad. You've just experienced the anchoring effect. The first price acted as an anchor, influencing your perception of subsequent prices. Kahneman explains how this bias can significantly impact negotiations and decision-making in various contexts. As you continue your investigation, you encounter the representativeness heuristic. You meet someone who's shy, neat, and loves libraries. Your brain immediately categorizes them as likely to be a librarian, even though statistically, they're more likely to be a farmer, because there are far more farmers than librarians. This heuristic leads us to judge the probability of something based on how closely it resembles our mental prototypes, often ignoring important statistical information. Your detective work leads you to explore the concept of substitution. You're asked a difficult question, how satisfied are you with your life? Instead of grappling with this complex query, your brain substitutes an easier question, what's my mood right now? This mental sleight of hand often goes unnoticed, but it can significantly influence our judgments and decisions. As night falls, you find yourself pondering the conjunction fallacy. You're presented with a description of a woman named Linda who is outspoken and concerned with issues of discrimination and social justice. When asked whether it's more likely that Linda is a. a bank teller, or b. a bank teller who is active in the feminist movement, many people choose b. But logically, the probability of two events occurring together, being a bank teller and a feminist, cannot be greater than the probability of one of those events occurring alone. This fallacy illustrates how our intuitive judgments can sometimes defy the laws of probability. Throughout your investigation, you encounter numerous other biases and heuristics. There's the sunk cost fallacy, where people continue investing in something because of past investments, even when it's no longer rational to do so. You explore loss aversion, the tendency for people to prefer avoiding losses to acquiring equivalent gains. And you delve into the planning fallacy, our tendency to underestimate the time and resources needed for future tasks. As your detective work comes to a close, you realize that these heuristics and biases are not flaws to be eliminated, but rather an integral part of how our minds work. They're often useful, allowing us to navigate a complex world with limited cognitive resources. But by understanding them, we can better recognize situations where our intuitive judgments might lead us astray and engage our slower, more deliberative system to thinking when necessary. Kahneman's exploration of heuristics and biases doesn't just reveal the quirks of human cognition, it provides a toolkit for better decision-making. By understanding these mental shortcuts and their potential pitfalls, we can make more informed choices, whether we're assessing risks, making financial decisions, or simply trying to understand why we think the way we do. This narrative journey through heuristics and biases sets the stage for the rest of Kahneman's book, providing crucial insights into how our minds process information and make judgments. It's a fundamental part of understanding the broader landscape of human decision-making that Kahneman explores throughout thinking, fast and slow. Part 3. Overconfidence You're an explorer, venturing into the treacherous terrain of the human psyche. Your mission, to uncover the secrets of overconfidence, as mapped out by Daniel Kahneman in Part 3 of Thinking, Fast and Slow. As you begin your journey, you encounter a group of investors, each convinced they can beat the market. They pore over financial reports, analyze trends, and make bold predictions. Yet, as Kahneman reveals, their confidence far exceeds their actual abilities. This is the illusion of skill at work. Like a mirage in the desert, it leads people to believe they have more control over outcomes than they actually do, especially in areas where luck plays a significant role. Venturing deeper, you come across a team of corporate planners, confidently outlining their strategy for the next five years. They've accounted for every variable, or so they think. What they haven't considered is the planning fallacy our tendency to underestimate the time, costs, and risks associated with future actions. Kahneman shows how this bias leads to unrealistic optimism, causing projects to run over budget and pass deadlines with alarming regularity. As you continue your expedition, you stumble upon a curious phenomenon, the illusion of validity. 
you meet experts who make predictions with unwavering certainty, despite evidence that their track record is no better than chance. Kahneman explains how this illusion persists even in the face of contradictory evidence, fueled by our tendency to create coherent stories from limited information. Your path leads you to a group of entrepreneurs, each convinced their startup will be the next big thing. Their enthusiasm is infectious, but Kahneman cautions about the dangers of optimism bias. While a positive outlook can be beneficial, excessive optimism can lead to underestimating risks and overestimating benefits, potentially setting the stage for failure. As night falls, you find yourself in a dimly lit room filled with decision makers. They're grappling with complex problems, yet many are surprisingly quick to reach conclusions. This, Kahneman explains, is the what you see is all there is, W-Y-S-I-A-T-I, principle in action. Our minds tend to make judgments based on available information, often failing to consider what we don't know. This can lead to overconfidence in our understanding of situations and our ability to predict outcomes. Dawn breaks, and you encounter a group of scientists reviewing their research. Even in this realm of supposed objectivity, Kahneman points out the hindsight bias at work. Once an outcome is known, it's all too easy to believe we would have predicted it all along. This I-knew-it-all-along effect can lead to overconfidence in our ability to foresee future events. As your journey nears its end, you come across perhaps the most pervasive form of overconfidence, our tendency to overestimate our own abilities relative to others. This is exemplified in studies where a majority of people rate themselves as above average in various skills a statistical impossibility. Kahneman explains how this self-serving bias can lead to poor decision-making and interpersonal conflicts. Throughout your expedition, Kahneman serves as your guide, pointing out the cognitive traps that lead to overconfidence. He shows how our fast, intuitive system one thinking often jumps to conclusions, creating a sense of coherence and understanding that may not be justified. Meanwhile, our more analytical system too often fails to engage fully, accepting these quick judgments without sufficient scrutiny. But Kahneman's exploration of overconfidence isn't just about identifying flaws in human reasoning. It's a call to awareness and action. By understanding these biases, we can learn to question our intuitions, seek out disconfirming evidence, and engage in more thorough, deliberative thinking when it matters most. As you emerge from your journey through the landscape of overconfidence, you carry with you valuable insights. You've learned that confidence, while often seen as a virtue, can be a double-edged sword. It can drive us to take necessary risks and persevere in the face of challenges. But unchecked, it can lead to poor decisions, missed opportunities, and costly mistakes. Kahneman's exploration of overconfidence serves as a crucial piece in the puzzle of human decision-making. It underscores the importance of humility, critical thinking, and the willingness to question our own judgments. Armed with these insights, we can navigate the complex terrain of decision-making with greater wisdom and effectiveness. Part 4. Choices Imagine you're a traveler in a strange land called Choice, guided by the wisdom of Daniel Kahneman as laid out in Part 4 of Thinking, Fast and Slow. This realm is filled with twisting paths, optical illusions, and hidden pitfalls that challenge your understanding of how people make decisions. As you begin your journey, you encounter a peculiar phenomenon, people seem to value things differently depending on whether they own them or not. This is the endowment effect in action. You watch as individuals demand much more to give up an object they own than they would be willing to pay to acquire it. Kahneman explains that this asymmetry stems from our tendency to feel losses more keenly than equivalent gains. Venturing further, you stumble upon a group of people faced with a choice between two medical treatments. Curiously, their decisions change dramatically depending on whether the outcomes are framed in terms of lives saved or lives lost, even though the statistical outcomes are identical. This is the power of framing effects, where the way information is presented can profoundly influence our choices. As you continue your exploration, you encounter prospect theory, Kahneman's revolutionary model of decision-making under risk. Unlike traditional economic theories that assume people always make rational choices, prospect theory acknowledges our very human quirks and inconsistencies. You observe people taking risks to avoid losses but playing it safe when it comes to gains. Kahneman explains how this asymmetry in risk attitudes shapes our decisions in countless ways, from financial investments to personal relationships. Your path leads you to a bustling marketplace where you witness the sunk cost fallacy in action. 
people cling to failing investments or persist with unenjoyable activities simply because they've already invested time or money. Kahneman reveals how this irrational behavior stems from our aversion to loss and our tendency to value things based on our past investments rather than their future prospects. As night falls, you find yourself in a casino, where the concept of probability waiting comes to life. You watch as gamblers overweight small probabilities, explaining why people buy lottery tickets despite the minuscule chances of winning. Simultaneously, you observe how people underweight moderate and high probabilities, which can lead to excessive risk-taking in other contexts. Dawn breaks, and you stumble upon a group of people grappling with a complex decision. You notice how they simplify the problem by focusing on a few key factors while ignoring others. This is the isolation effect, or focusing illusion, at work. Kahneman explains how this tendency to concentrate on certain aspects of a choice while neglecting others can lead to suboptimal decisions. Your journey takes an unexpected turn as you explore the concept of mental accounting. You observe people treating money differently based on how they've categorized it in their minds, even though money should be fungible. A windfall might be spent frivolously, while salary is carefully budgeted, despite both being equally valuable. As your adventure nears its end, you encounter perhaps the most profound insight of all, the difference between the experiencing self and the remembering self. You watch as people make choices based not on how they will experience something, but on how they anticipate remembering it. Kahneman reveals how this distinction shapes our decisions, from vacation planning to medical treatments. Throughout your journey, Kahneman serves as your guide, illuminating the hidden forces that shape our choices. He shows how our fast, intuitive system one often drives our decisions, leading to predictable biases and errors. Meanwhile, our more deliberative system too often fails to correct these mistakes, instead rationalizing the choices our intuition has already made. But Kahneman's exploration of choice isn't just about identifying our decision-making flaws. It's a map for navigating the complex terrain of human decision-making. By understanding these biases and tendencies, we can make more informed choices, design better policies, and create environments that nudge people towards better decisions. As you emerge from the land of choice, you carry with you valuable insights. You've learned that our decisions are shaped by a complex interplay of cognitive biases, emotional responses, and contextual factors. You understand that the rational economic model of decision-making is often a poor predictor of actual human behavior. Kahneman's exploration of choice serves as a crucial piece in the puzzle of human behavior. It challenges traditional assumptions about rationality and offers a more nuanced, psychologically grounded model of decision-making. Armed with these insights, we can better understand our own choices, anticipate the behavior of others, and design systems and policies that work with, rather than against, the quirks of human psychology. Part 5. Two Selves Your mission is to uncover the mystery of the two selves, the experiencing self and the remembering self. As you begin your journey, you find yourself observing people's lives as they unfold in real time. You notice how they react to pleasure and pain, joy and sorrow, moment by moment. This, Kahneman explains, is the domain of the experiencing self. It's the part of us that lives in the present, feeling every sensation, emotion, and thought as it occurs. You watch a woman on vacation, basking in the sun on a beautiful beach. Her experiencing self is content, soaking in the warmth and the sound of the waves. But then, just before she leaves, a sudden rainstorm hits. As she packs up, you can see her disappointment. You wonder, will this brief unpleasant experience overshadow her entire vacation? This is where you encounter the remembering self. As the woman recounts her vacation later to friends, you notice something curious. Despite hours of enjoyment, her memory of the trip is disproportionately influenced by that final rainy moment. Kahneman reveals that the remembering self doesn't simply record our experiences, it creates a story, heavily influenced by how experiences end and by peak moments, whether good or bad. Your exploration takes you to a hospital, where you observe patients undergoing colonoscopies. In a fascinating experiment, Kahneman shows how extending a painful procedure by adding a less intense but still uncomfortable period at the end can lead patients to remember the overall experience as less unpleasant. This peak-end rule demonstrates how the remembering self can diverge dramatically from the actual lived experience. As you delve deeper, you begin to understand the profound implications of this duality. 
you watch people make decisions about their future based not on what will bring them the most pleasure or least pain in the moment, but on what they think will create the best memories. Kahneman explains that it's the remembering self that makes decisions, often prioritizing future memories over present experiences. Your journey leads you to ponder questions of well-being and happiness. You observe how people assess their life satisfaction, noticing that their evaluations often have little to do with the proportion of time they spend in a positive or negative state. Instead, their judgments are shaped by the stories they tell themselves about their lives, stories crafted by the remembering self. As night falls, you find yourself contemplating the ethical implications of this duality. If the experiencing self and the remembering self can diverge so dramatically, which one should we prioritize when making decisions or crafting policies? Kahneman doesn't provide a definitive answer but invites us to consider this profound question. Dawn breaks, and you encounter perhaps the most poignant illustration of the two selves, end-of-life decisions. You watch as people grapple with choices about medical treatments, often prioritizing the creation of a positive final chapter for their life story over minimizing suffering in their remaining moments. This stark example highlights the power of the remembering self in shaping our most important decisions. Throughout your expedition, Kahneman serves as your guide, illuminating the complex interplay between these two selves. He shows how this duality influences everything from our daily choices to our life's biggest decisions. The experiencing self lives each moment, but it's the remembering self that keeps score and makes the rules. As you emerge from your journey, you carry with you a profound new understanding of human nature. You've learned that we are not unified entities making decisions based solely on our experiences. Instead, we are complex beings with two selves that often have conflicting interests. Kahneman's exploration of the two selves serves as a crucial piece in the puzzle of human behavior and decision-making. It challenges our assumptions about happiness, well-being, and the nature of experience itself. Armed with these insights, we can better understand our own choices, reassess our priorities, and perhaps find ways to balance the needs of both our experiencing and remembering selves. This concept of two selves provides a fitting conclusion to Kahneman's book, tying together many of the themes explored earlier. It underscores the complexity of human cognition and decision-making, reminding us that even our most fundamental experiences are shaped by the quirks of our mental processes. As you conclude your narrative journey through thinking, fast and slow, you're left with a richer, more nuanced understanding of the human mind, and perhaps, a greater appreciation for the mysterious depths of your own consciousness. The End